Thanks for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. Negotiations are continuing, but Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu refuses to compromise on a ceasefire deal that Hamas has agreed to. The U.S. is playing down Israel's control of Gaza's Rafah border crossing. Russian President Vladimir Putin begins his fifth, sixth year tenure as the country's leader after his inauguration ceremony, which was largely boycotted by the U.S. and most EU nations. High demand for eco-friendly vehicles, and namely hybrid cars, allowed South Korea to secure further record-high export figures in April. They were especially popular in the U.S. and Europe. Negotiations over a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hamas have reportedly resumed in Cairo. But any deal still seems some way off. Our Kim bo -kyung reports. Calling it far from meeting its demands, Israel has not accepted a ceasefire deal proposed by Egypt and Qatar, which Hamas has agreed to. In a statement on Tuesday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, that the latest truce proposal from Hamas was designed to torpedo the entry of Israeli forces into Rafah, which did not happen. While saying it is necessary to put military pressure on Hamas for the return of its own hostages, he firmly stated that Israel would not accept a proposal that endangers its own people's security. Israel cannot accept a proposal that endangers the security of our citizens and the future of our country. Therefore, I have instructed the labor ranks that went to Cairo continue to stand firm on the conditions necessary for the release of our hostages, continue to stand firm on the essential requirements for guaranteeing Israel's security. Netanyahu's words come after Hamas declared on Monday evening that it has agreed to a ceasefire deal. Meanwhile, Israel have pushed on with their military operations in Rafah, seizing control of the Gaza side of the Rafah border crossing on Tuesday morning. To this, a senior Hamas official warned that if Israel's military operations continue in Rafah, there will be no ceasefire deal. If the aggression continues, there will be no ceasefire because Israelis are the ones attacking and shooting. This agreement, which the movement agreed to, represents the minimum that responds to the demands of our people and our resistance. Amid the ongoing fighting between Israel and Hamas, the White House has confirmed that discussions on negotiations have resumed in Cairo, Egypt, and that CIA Director Bill Burns is there. While saying that they should be able to close the remaining gaps, the national security spokesman added that the U.S. will do everything to support the process. In a separate briefing, the White House spokesperson made it clear that Washington does not want to see a major operation taking place in Rafah and that it wants to see a comprehensive plan from Israel to protect civilians who have sought refuge there. Kim bo -kyung, Arirang News. Russian President Vladimir Putin was sworn in on Tuesday for his fifth term in office. During his inauguration speech, he emphasized Russia's willingness to hold dialogue with the West, but only on equal terms. Ising to has more. Tuesday marked the beginning of another six years in office for Russian President Vladimir Putin, with this inauguration ceremony taking place in Moscow. His fifth term in office comes amid fierce criticism from the West, amid the prolonged war in Ukraine. During his inauguration speech, Putin expressed willingness to hold talks with the West, but only on equal terms. Dialogue, including on issues of security and strategic stability, is possible, but not from a position of force. Without any arrogance, snobbishness, feeling of one's own exclusiveness, but only as equals, respecting each other's interests. Putin also stressed that the country's state, public and political system must remain strong and resistant to any challenges and threats in order to maintain the stable development, unity and independence of Russia. The Russian leader also vowed to grow Russia into the world's fourth largest economy by 2030. The ambitious goal comes as Putin signed a decree that sets national development goals for 2030 and beyond on the day of his inauguration. In the decree, Putin called for Russia's GDP growth to be above the global average, while increasing research and development costs to 2 percent of GDP by 2030, raising the ranking of R&D spending compared to economic size 
to within the world's top 10. Meanwhile, South Korea's ambassador to Russia, Lee Do-hoon, attended the inauguration. A South Korean government official who spoke on the condition of anonymity said that Lee's participation was decided after careful consideration of various pending bilateral issues and the need to manage bilateral relations with Moscow. His visit also came despite the boycott of Western countries amid the protracted war in Ukraine. Lee Seung-je, Arirang News. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un sent a congratulatory letter to Russian President Vladimir Putin. According to the regime state media on Wednesday, the letter was delivered through the Russian embassy in Pyongyang. Kim had also sent a letter to Putin in March after Russia's presidential election to congratulate him on his re-election and promise stronger cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. This comes amid rising concerns from South Korea and the U.S. over military ties between North Korea and Russia, which have deepened significantly since a rare summit between Kim and Putin last September. Chinese leader Xi Jinping continues his European tour as he and his French counterpart met for the second straight day on Tuesday. Advisors to the French president described the trip as Macron establishing an outside of a protocol personal relationship, which he has a history of doing with his counterparts. Ian Jin reports. The trip to Europe by China's head of state Xi Jinping, which began in France, coincides with the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between the two countries. In a press conference, French President Emmanuel Macron expressed gratitude to Xi for making the trip to France at such a sensitive time for the world and highlighted the importance of a stable EU-China relationship. The France-China relationship is steeped in history and features mutual respect and mutual trust. I believe it can play a useful role beyond bilateral relations and, to a large extent, promote EU-China relations and world stability. Following a trilateral meeting with Macron and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in Paris on Monday, the Chinese leader visited the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France on Tuesday. Accompanied by their wives on the trip, Xi and Macron met for the second straight day, with talks said to have been friendly in nature. Reports say Xi made few concessions on a number of issues raised by Macron, including Beijing's ties with Moscow on the prolonged war in Ukraine. Following traditional performances by locals, Macron gifted Xi a woolen blanket made in the Pyrenees, along with a Tour de France jersey and Armagnac from the nearby southwestern region, which is a brandy at risk of Chinese trade sanctions. Advisors to the French president described the trip as being in line with Macron's history of trying to establish outside of protocol personal relationships with his counterparts. With Xi, he wasn't able to hug or make other gestures like winking or slapping his counterparts on the back, which he had done in the past with U.S. President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin. France was the first leg of the Chinese president's three-nation European tour from May 5th to 10th. She arrived in Serbia on Tuesday to continue a trip that is seen as an attempt to split U.S.-led anti-China initiatives in Europe. Next up on Xi's European tour is a trip to Hungary. For both Serbia and Hungary, China is the largest trading partner outside the European Union. Ian Jin, Arirang News. South Korea's top diplomat will head to Beijing ahead of the summit between the leaders of South Korea, Japan and China that will likely take place later this month here in Seoul. Eyes are now on whether Jotir's China visit will be a stepping stone to softening Seoul-Beijing relations. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei reports. Foreign Minister Chuk Taeyeol is reportedly set to visit Beijing next week as South Korea seeks to mend relations with China before the country's leaders meet for a trilateral summit in Seoul. South Korean media reported Tuesday that his trip will take place sometime around May 13th. The foreign ministry has yet to confirm but did not deny that his visit will take place soon. South Korea and China have been communicating closely based on a mutual understanding of the importance of high-level talks. We are in the final stages of talks regarding Minister Cho Taeyeol's visit to China. This is Cho's first visit to China since he took office in January. It's also the first visit to Beijing by a South Korean foreign minister in more than six years. Chu is set to hold talks with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi and discuss a wide range of bilateral and global matters, including security issues such as asking for China's constructive role in countering North Korea's nuclear missile threats 
as well as economic issues. The top diplomat visit comes ahead of the trilateral summit between the leaders of South Korea, Japan and China that will likely take place later this month in Seoul. Seoul's foreign ministry earlier said South Korea is in final consultations with Beijing and Tokyo to hold the upcoming summit on May 26th and 27th. If it takes place this month, this will be the first time in almost four and a half years since the meeting last took place in Chengdu in December 2019. Relations between Seoul and Beijing have been strained over the issue of China forcibly sending back North Korean defectors. Recently, the Chinese government reportedly sent back a large number of escapees to North Korea, with human rights groups in South Korea saying that China repatriated at least 260 of them in late April. All eyes are now on whether Cho's visit to Beijing could help stabilize ties between the two countries. Peunji, Arirang News. South Korea's auto exports hit a record high in April on the back of increased demand for eco-friendly vehicles, namely hybrid cars. Our business correspondent Lee Soo-jin has the figures. South Korea's auto exports reached a new monthly high in April. Data released by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Wednesday showed that the value of car exports stood at 6.8 billion U.S. dollars, topping the previous record set in November last year. This is up 10.3 percent compared to April the previous year. And the cumulative value of exports for the January to April period rose 4.7 percent on year to some $24 billion, also a record high for that period. The ministry mostly attributed the rise in car exports to the high demand for eco-friendly cars and SUVs, especially in North America. By region, the value of outbound shipments to North America was the highest, rising more than 36 percent compared to the previous year. The export value of eco-friendly vehicles surged more than 11 percent on year to $2.29 billion, smashing the previous record set in March last year. This was led by a surge in the value of outbound shipments of hybrid car exports in April, which jumped a whopping 55 percent compared to the previous year. Domestic production levels were also up 3.5 percent on year, with over 390,000 units manufactured in April, the most produced in a single month since March last year, partly due to there being one more working day compared to April last year. And while overall domestic sales dropped 5.5 percent compared to the previous year, the high demand for hybrid vehicles was also seen domestically as well, as sales surged 35 percent on year. The trade ministry says that its auto export target for this year is $75 billion. As part of its plans to reach this goal, it will allocate some $320 million this year and $1.4 billion over the next five years into automotive technology development in partnership with the private sector. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. And the South Korean government is set to inject 9.7 trillion won, or 7.1 billion U.S. dollars, into the domestic battery and automobile industries this year amid the U.S. government's decision last Friday to delay sanctions by two years for electric vehicles containing Chinese graphite. Trade Minister An Dukun held a meeting on Wednesday with leaders from the battery and automobile sectors to review the implications of Washington's decision. Now, during the meeting, An emphasized the crucial need for self-sufficiency in the domestic battery industry supply chain over the next two years. He also called for strengthened collaboration between Korea's battery and auto sectors and the government. TikTok and its Chinese parent company ByteDance are suing the U.S. government to block a law that could result in a U.S. ban for the popular app. The lawsuit filed on Tuesday in the U.S. Court of Appeals argues that the law signed by President Biden last month violates free speech protections and is silencing 170 million American users of the platform. U.S. lawmakers passed a law over concerns user data could be shared with China and give ByteDance until January next year to sell the app or have its services blocked. With the companies hoping to block the bill's implementation with the lawsuit, watchers say the legal process is likely to be lengthy and could go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
This year marks 140 years of diplomatic relations between Korea and Italy. Now celebrating the occasion, a project aiming to bolster cultural exchanges between the two countries has kicked off. Our Song Yujin has this report. Though more than 9,000 kilometers apart, Korea and Italy have a lot in common. That's how Korea's culture minister Yoo In-chon describes the two countries' ties. Korea's connection with Italy runs deep. Geographically, they're both located on peninsulas. And on a personal note, I see parallels in their people, the joyful energy, trendy style and abundant talent. 2024 marks the 140th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Korea and Italy. To celebrate, both countries have declared 2024 to 2025 as a year of cultural exchange. Minister Yu took a 3-day visit to Rome for the opening night of the 2024-2025 Korea-Italy year of cultural exchange. Italy has long been a source of inspiration for him. My first trip to Italy was in around 1987, from Rome to Napoli to Sicily. The weight of history and tradition hit me like a ton of bricks. And every time I visit this country, it makes me focus on the present and future. During my term, I want to create festivals that can represent Korea and that people from all over the world can enjoy together. For example, an opera festival like Verona's. The culture ministry aims to foster a blend of modern and traditional cultural exchanges through this project, not just K-pop or K-dramas. Plans include holding traditional and contemporary Korean dance performances, exhibiting artwork by veteran Korean artists, and holding tourism fairs in Italy. But the most important thing is forging lasting connections. What matters is providing a chance for young talent from both countries to interact and collaborate so they can together create a cultural fusion unique to Korea and Italy. For instance, we're thinking of creating a small-scale joint opera production. Through this cultural diplomacy, both countries hope to deepen their ties even further. Song Yujin, Arirang News, Rome. One of the most prestigious arts and entertainment awards here in South Korea, the Baeksang Arts Awards, took place on Tuesday. Director Kim Sung Soo of December 12th the day won the grand prize in a film, while Disney Plus original series Moving won the grand prize in television. The movie, December 12th the day, based on the December 12th military coup in 1979, attracted around 13 million viewers last year. The Moving is a fantasy drama based on a webtoon of the same name and is the second series from a streaming platform to win the award following Netflix's Squid Game in 2022. The movie with the most awards, though, was Exuma, the occult horror movie, which was the first to reach the 10 million milestone this year, won four awards, including Best Director and Best Actress. The Pakistan Art Awards have been held since 1965, and this year marks the 60th edition. It's two years since Chongwade, the former presidential office, also referred to as the Blue House, was transformed into a cultural landmark and open to the public. And to celebrate the anniversary, the Culture Ministry and the Chongwade Foundation are hosting a special concert named Blue House. The Blue House performance series combines artistic concerts, including traditional Korean music and dance, theater, jazz, and video art. The concert will take place at the main building every Wednesday at 8 p.m. and will be presented by a mini concert at 5 p.m. until July 10. With many more concerts and exhibitions hosted until the fall, Chongade continues its journey to develop into a diverse cultural and artistic hub. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In the United States, there were some heated exchanges on the 13th day of former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trial involving one of the case's central figures, adult film actress Stormy Daniels. Daniels, who alleges she was paid 130,000 U.S. dollars to remain quiet about a sexual encounter with the former president, was on the witness stand and was given a difficult time by the defense who accused her of extortion. Daniels repeatedly denied the claims and voices were raised during the cross-examination. 
Earlier, while being questioned by the prosecution, Daniels gave details of the alleged encounter in a Lake Tao hotel in 2006, including a reference to the silk pajamas worn by Trump. Trump is facing 34 felony counts of falsifying business records as part of a scheme to suppress negative stories that could have influenced his presidential campaign. The trial is set to resume Thursday when Trump's defense team will continue cross-examining Daniels. India, the world's most populous nation, is in the third phase of its seven-phase general election that began on April 19th. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Union Home Minister Amit Shah were among the voters on Tuesday. Voting for the third phase of election started at 7 a.m. in 93 constituencies, spread across 11 states and union territories. However, there were reports of sporadic incidents of violence in four constituencies. The third phase of the elections for the Lok Sabha, India's lower house, has over 1,300 candidates in the fray, including around 120 women. Multinational tech giant Apple on Tuesday unveiled its latest OLED screens for its high-end iPad Pro models, including the iPad Air and iPad Pro tablets. Apple CEO Tim Cook said it marked the biggest day for iPad since its introduction. It's also the first time Apple has released new iPad models since 2022, the longest gap between updates since the product was launched in 2011. The iPad Pro, Apple's top-of-the-range tablet, will be available in two sizes, an 11-inch model and a 13-inch model, and is reportedly thinner than previous models, measuring only 5.1 millimeters in thickness. In Canada, police say a security guard at rapper Drake's Toronto mansion was shot and seriously wounded in the early hours of Tuesday morning. Authorities say shots were fired from a vehicle before suspects fled the scene. It has not been confirmed whether the five-time Grammy Award winner was at home during the incident. Drake and U.S. rapper Lamar have been involved in an escalating war of words, with each releasing tracks dissing the other. The police said the motive behind the shooting, as well as the details of the shooter or the vehicle, are not yet known. Choi ji Arirang News. Good afternoon. Morning rain in certain parts of the country has let up, but Jeollanam-do province and Jeju could see rain into the afternoon. Then after murky and wet skies, things will get much brighter in the south. Meanwhile, the capital area had a sunny but chilly start to parents' day. Breezy morning temperatures are rising fast to the 20s this afternoon, and we'll notice temperatures getting closer to the norms as the week goes on. Take good care of yourself during the temperature roller coaster. After the highs, it should be 1 to 7 degrees higher today. Seoul gets up to 21 degrees, but Busan will be breezier at 18 degrees Celsius. Much brighter skies in store with decent air quality nationwide. So it's a good day to spend some time outdoors in the afternoon if you can with sun protection items. We are looking at another chance of nationwide rain this weekend. Then things will get much more as we head towards mid-May. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. That's all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.